I'm excited to do this topic, Jonah and the Great Fish, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was requested by a viewer. And secondly, I really want to get some discernment out to people watching this sermon lesson. Because if you understand the book of Jonah very thoroughly, you're going to be able to apply the lessons here throughout all other places of Scripture, because all the Scripture ties together. And what I'm going to be talking about uh, in the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes, I'm really excited to share. And I want you guys to be able to participate. So I've structured this a little bit differently this time around. So that being said, please look at the screen and grab your Bibles as well. I'm going to read the first five verses out of Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So my first comment is, just in these first five verses, there is so much spiritual foreshadowment and edification going on here. The lesson is quite deep. It's far beyond the parable that we're being taught. There's spiritual lessons throughout the rest of Scripture that we need to take heed and notice. So what I'm going to request is that everyone grab their Bibles because I would like this to be something that you guys can participate in with the Bible in your hand. The book of Jonah is just four chapters. It doesn't take that long to read and study, but I think it's something that I hope everyone watching this video sermon lesson reads the four chapters and masters the subject of this lesson. I'm going to talk about spiritual vocabulary, concealment of doctrine that is being done by breaking any part of Scripture. I'm going to give some examples there. I'm going to tie in some key verses from other books in the Bible that tie into the book of Jonah. And then I will discuss what spiritual lessons can we take out of this that apply to us today. And then I'll give a conclusion. So I'm really excited about this. It's an honor to do it because I think it's something that will be fun to look at because it's a short book. And there's, a, there's some things that I think all of us are going to learn by taking a look at this. Um, so that being said, I'm going to continue and start by just... If this is the first time you've seen one of the video sermon lessons that I put out, I want everybody to know that I keep my own notes. I've got an extensive list of my own spiritual vocabulary that has been given to me by the Holy Spirit. So I put down all my notes in places that I find things in Scripture, and I have my spiritual definition list, which is pretty long. This is a very short sample of spiritual terms that apply to the book of Jonah. But I wanted to show this so that people understand how I organize myself as a Christian. So I've got just a few examples here where I define a, a symbol or a term uh, and then places that that will occur in God's word and what the spiritual meaning is in the column on the right. So I don't want to go through and explain all of them. It's pretty much 
something that every person who is a Christian should consider doing this. You need to know, for example, that if God is talking about fish, spiritually those fish are also equivalent to people. And there's places in Scripture that define that. But that's how spiritual edification works. So feel free to pause and study this. I'm going to continue. So these are just examples of my spiritual vocabulary, as I mentioned. But I'm going to go on to chapter 1. And I'm going to ask everyone to pause and read the entire chapter. And as I'm asking people to do that, I've got a Bible in front of me where I'm going through and uh, taking a quick look at what I read. And I'm going to continue commenting on what is going on here spiritually. First of all, Jonah also spiritually represents Christians, believers in Jesus Christ. And I'll get to that in more detail soon. Great city is Babylon. It says that in the book of Revelation. Nineveh, which is described to be a great city, would be people coming out of Babylon. They're repenting. A ship is a Bible. That's a fundamental teaching by the power of the Holy Spirit that all of us need to know. When God talks about ships, he's just telling the Christians about Bibles. Sea would be people. Oftentimes, if they're raging you know, with waves, you know, like it says in the book of Jude, it's people that are lost, they have strife, they're not saved. But sea means people spiritually. Wind stands for doctrine. I think I have one example up here in Ephesians chapter 4. If you look at the upper right portion of the screen, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Men are deceivers. Every man's a liar according to God. So we don't want to get tossed around by the ear-tickling winds of worldly doctrine that have permeated Christianity and caused the whole world to be drunk and to also slumber. Broken means chastened or corrupted. The scriptures cannot be broken, so Jesus Christ is unbroken. They didn't break any bones when they took him down from the cross, and the scriptures are Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. He is not broken. The scriptures cannot be broken. But many corrupt the word. So when you think about broken, think about being chastened or corrupted. And if a sea has a ship in it, and that ship becomes shipwrecked, what does that mean? Is God talking about a corrupt Bible, for example? Something to pray about. Sleep, lack of discernment. You can be a heathen, lost person sleeping. Or you can be a saved Christian sleeping. You lack discernment because God's closed your eyes. You don't know what's going on until he wakes you up. People have to understand that there is not an even playing field in Christianity. We all discern by the power of the Holy Spirit what the Most High has given us as gifts. So I don't really care if I'm the only person that discerns what I discern when I read the Bible as long as it's coming from the Holy Spirit and is able to be reconciled precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, here a little there a little, as God says in, in Isaiah chapter 28. So there is discernment available spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit based on spiritual gifts. Okay, so uh, you don't grab your Strong's lexicon or or try to see who's the smartest person out there. Christianity doesn't work like that at all. Okay, which is why this lesson will be wildly different than what most people have heard about the book of Jonah. Uh, God with a small g is nothing more than an idol, a false deity. Dry land is when you believe in God's word. So, for example, when God parted the Red Sea and Israel was able to go on dry land and not be harmed by the the waves of the Red Sea, that's because they believed God. Um, and this same concept applies here in the book of Jonah. Uh, dry land is when Jonah 
finally cried and he believed God. A great fish is Antichrist or Leviathan. This is a very basic teaching. So the great fish spiritually in the book of Jonah would be Leviathan. Okay, Leviathan to many in the Christian community is simply a crocodile. They, they can't see beyond the literal because they've been conditioned to accept corruption and delight in it, and also they, they've been conditioned to accept the Babylonian apologetics in the markets rather than being edified by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so great fish is Leviathan. Please read chapter 2, pause this, and when you're done reading the chapter, you can continue to listen to my commentary. So in chapter 2, we've got Jonah, who's in the belly of a great fish, uh, praying to God. And, you know, God is hearing his prayers and having, ultimately, compassion on Jonah because of what happens at the end of the chapter. So, in this chapter, you've got the spiritual vocabulary that you've gained from chapter 1, but in addition, I want you to consider that when God talks about the deep, he's talking to Christians about counsel from words. Okay, when he's talking about floods, he's talking about any decrees against God. So, for example, out of the mouth of the serpent goes a flood after the woman... Uh, that would be trying to carry the Christians away in the imagination of their hearts. That's what the devil does. Okay, he casts doubt on the word of God even after people get saved. Bars are prisons of Babylon. For example, I've got in Job chapter 40, Lucifer, his bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. So his scriptures, which are the bones, which cannot be broken, okay, are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. His scriptures keep people in a spiritual prison. And we've got that symbol going on here in chapter 2. So just consider what's going on in the chapter on a spiritual level. And then to vomit is to reject. When God uh, caused the great fish to vomit Jonah out onto dry land, it was by God's power that uh, Leviathan rejected Jonah and put him back up onto dry land because Jonah believed God. He cried out to the Lord. Does the dry land also foreshadow Jesus Christ? These are things that all of us should be thinking about and praying about as we read chapter 2. So I'm going to continue on with chapter 3 and ask everyone to pause and read chapter 3. And then when you're done reading chapter 3, you can resume. I've got my Bible in front of me, and I've read chapter 3. So, uh, some words that I'd like to share. Fasting means to cease from feeding on idolatry. There was a 40-day fast in Nineveh. Was there any tie-in to Jesus Christ fasting 40 days in the wilderness? Is that symbolic of something? Uh, water is symbolic of the word. Could be God's word or bitter water. Uh, you know, ultimately words coming out of Leviathan's mouth. Uh, to repent means to turn from something. In this case, turn from transgressions or evil. As Christians, we all need to understand the definition of sin or transgression is called unrighteousness. Okay, you're either righteous or you're not. It's not by works of your flesh that make you righteous. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. When you get sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are righteous because the law has been fulfilled because you've had faith in Jesus Christ. So to repent as a person means to turn from transgressions. When God repents, he repents of the evil that he's going to send on to people, uh, you know, to punish them, you know, as long as they believe God. Arise means waking up into discernment. I want everybody to be aware that going back to chapter 1, there's a lot of, um, God talks a lot about how Jonah was sleepy. And he says, arise, Jonah. And he says it here again in this chapter, wake into discernment. Hear the word of God. 
not as the heathen does, but hear the word of God through faith and belief. Okay, just don't pay uh, lip service to God, but believe him when he speaks. Wake into discernment. Violence is idolatry. It's spiritually equivalent to idolatry. If you have violence in your hand, yes, there is literal violence. All this stuff that happened in Nineveh is absolutely true on a literal level, but we as Christians are discerning spiritual things as well. So idolatry, if you look at the images I have on the screen, I'm, I'm going to say, based on what God has taught me, the most idolatrous uh, offense against God is all these false Bibles that God essentially calls dunghills, rightfully placed in the toilet that I show here, these false corrupt Bibles that make a false Christ and don't give people discernment. People are not getting born again. They don't have oil in them. Uh, they're lamps without oil. These corrupt scriptures that have flooded the markets today. This one, I think, is a New King James from Gideon. It's in the toilet. God views it as a piece of dung. Okay, and he says that in scripture. Um, and then you've got in the center of the screen your typical Roman Catholic um, idolatrous. They've got little pictures of Jesus with the sacred heart, little statues of the crucifixion of Mary and the baby Jesus and Joseph, and all these little statues and idols, which are just false images of who God is, uh, totally unnecessary. At one point in history, people used symbols like this to teach because maybe languages were more primitive, there, there were, you know, access to the scriptures was limited. I can understand this, but this day and age, there's no reason for all of this. This is just idolatry. We don't know what Jesus looked like, but he sure didn't look like the picture that you see right there. Jesus had no form of uh, comeliness in his appearance. Okay, his appearance was not a distraction in any way to people. His purpose was served through giving the word without drawing attention to himself in a physical sense unnecessarily. And then over on the right side, you've got your Eastern deities, your, you know, Hindu deities or whatever they are. Uh, you know, just another flavor of your typical Roman Catholic Marian deities, uh, in my opinion, just false gods, idols. So this all ties into what's going on today. And this is what Nineveh was struggling with. They were caught in idolatry. So I put an example up there, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of, the water, of water by the word. It's just one example of sharing with you spiritual vocabulary and how these terms are defined in God's word. <clears throat> Continuing on to chapter 4, Please pause and read the chapter, and once you do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start commenting here. Uh, a booth is a type of faith that pe people profess. So a booth is like a temporary structure for housing. It's temporary. It's something that I built a booth when I was out in the wilderness when I was in Boy Scouts. I spent the night in it. Um, you know, I had to do that for, I think it was wilderness survival. Um and it, it took me a couple hours to make a booth. It was a temporary structure to keep rain off me and to keep, let's just say, sun off me, even though I think most of the time I spent in it was at nighttime. Okay, but a booth in this case that Jonah built symbolized his type of faith, okay, that he professed. Uh, as it says in the New Testament, you have a household of faith, and a booth can be symbolic of someone just Okay, short term, they, they profess some type of faith, but maybe they're not permanently rooted in that faith. You can confess Jesus with your mouth uh, on a natural level, but you can't confess Jesus Christ with your mouth on a spiritual level unless you've been born again. So that's why many can go out with us, but they can't continue with us because they fall away because you're not saved. If you're not saved, you can't continue in this stuff. Uh, it's just not going to happen. To sit or sat is feeding or resting on words. When you sit, you typically eat or you rest. 
when you have rest to your souls, it's because you believe the word of God. Sitting means that you're feeding on words. It could be good words or it could be not so good words. But that's what the symbol means spiritually. Shadow is protection from decrees. I did a, a lesson not too long ago where I gave some illustrations. You've got a, a good shadow and maybe a bad shadow depending on which decrees you're being sheltered from. A gourd is our words giving discernment. A gourd is something you can chop up and make soup out of uh, and eat, let's say, spiritual food. Or a gourd is something that can, in this case, provide protection from decrees. Words giving discernment would be what a gourd is spiritually. A worm symbolizes famine. In God's word, he talks about the canker worm and the palmer worm and the caterpillar how they cause a devastating famine, and it's revealed spiritually, not of bread, but of hearing of the words of God. When the worm smites the gourd, it means that God has allowed the Babylonians to corrupt his word so that there's no discernment. Back to going to sleep like Jonah was. Cattle would be people declaring faith. Just declaring faith could be good faith, could be bad faith, but that's what cattle is symbolic of. In Acts chapter 12, on the upper right-hand portion of the screen, it says, And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. Uh, I think this is in reference to Herod, if I remember correctly, uh, when he was persecuting Peter, and going to kill Peter, and cast him into prison. But the whole point is, is that um, God wasn't being given the glory, so he was eaten of worms. And people that are tormented in the lake of fire has, have worms that dieth not. They're going to be punished because that's what a worm is symbolic of, either famine or punishment. That your punishment will be continuous if you have a problem with a worm because you don't believe God. So I've got some images on the screen to kind of tie in. The symbols that are going on in the chapter there but what I really want here is for people to pause and read the chapters and then take into consideration the spiritual vocabulary that I'm offering here and see how God opens up the meaning of what's going on in the chapters to everyone based on your spiritual gifts I'm going to talk about whale now, I'm doing a lesson on Jonah and the great fish, but I'm willing to say that many people would think, and especially those that think they're Christians, would associate Jonah and the whale. Well, there is no such statement in God's word, Jonah and the whale. It's Jonas. So if we go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Big difference between Jonas and Jonah, because Jonas is a term that Jesus Christ is using to tell the Christians that there is a spiritual lesson going on, that the name changes because of spiritual meaning. Kind of like Abram became Abraham and Sarai became Sarah, there was a justification there. In this case, Jesus is telling us about Jonas, describing a group of people that probably are stiff-necked, but ultimately will believe him. And they're spending time in the whale's belly. So we really need to know, when Jesus Christ makes this statement to us, what is he talking about? But first, I'd like to ask some questions. Why do many or all modern Bibles change the word whale in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, and or Ezekiel 32, verse 2, to something else. I think the bigger offender here is the book of Ezekiel, where you really struggle to find the word whale in any translation that is considered modern. Why is that? Why do almost all of these modern Bibles change piercing in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1? Leviathan is the piercing serpent. There is no other way to describe him. He's the piercing serpent. And we need to know the word piercing because there's a valuable lesson there. 
My question is, is this done to conceal the lesson? Well, the scripture can't be broken, so God will put you in a spirit of slumber anyway, um, if he wants to. But they're going above and beyond here by changing so many words. How does anybody know anything spiritually? Well, the answer is they don't. There is no spiritual lesson in these modern Bibles. God calls them dumb idols. Mouths they have, but they don't speak. Ears they have, but they don't hear. There's no understanding in them. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, is the full verse there. I'm going to throw this out. We need to know what the heart of the earth is. If you think about spiritual terms, if you think about what is a heart, a heart is a place where the good seed, if it lands on it, it it's like landing in good ground or good soil, according to the parable of the sower, and then that seed can take root and bring forth much fruit, if I remember the parable correctly. But if you have a hardened heart, and the seed lands on it, uh, ultimately the devil will come away and sweep you away in the imagination of your heart. But the heart is symbolic of good ground, good earth, good soil. And um, it also, this foreshadows Jesus Christ paying the ultimate sacrifice for us and his physical body being put in the ground for three days and three nights. But I also believe there's another spiritual lesson going on here as well. In Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 2, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, and thou art as a whale in the seas. Well, immediately when I read that, I'm associating Pharaoh. I know that he is also called Leviathan, because Job chapter 41, much of it is revealed in the book of Ezekiel to describe how Pharaoh gets a hook in his jaws as well. So we know that God is calling Pharaoh Leviathan. Um, but what's important is in Revelation chapter 11 verse 8, we learn that, um, that the great city is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So this great city, which Nineveh was called, is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom being a city, Egypt being a country, that sits on seven mountains, which is the Vatican today, or the city of Rome. And everybody agrees with that. Virtually everybody in Christianity understands Rome to be uh, Babylon. Uh, so now we've got a lesson here where we can associate the head of Babylon, or spiritual Egypt, being as a whale in the seas, and Jonas a group of people that would believe God being in the whale's belly, so we need to know what a belly is. But first, it says in Job chapter 41, verse 6, Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Jesus says, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, ye have no life in you. Lucifer wants to be like the Most High. So Lucifer's Antichrist, Leviathan, is going to have his flesh be fed in the markets. And almost everyone that I've ever met is feeding on Leviathan's flesh in the markets today. The markets are places where you're going to buy these phony, corrupt Bibles, and you're going to be eating the flesh of Leviathan, and you're not going to know what's going on in this world. Uh, because the bro bones have been broken, the ships have been broken, and, um, and God has spoken it. In Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 5, it says, I have given thee for meat to the beast of the field. God is talking to Pharaoh. He's talking to Leviathan. He's telling Leviathan, I'm going to feed your corrupt flesh to people. And then if, at the end of the book of uh, chapter 39 of the book of Job, we learn that Leviathan is the carcass that Babylon is feeding off of. Where the slain are, there is he. How did the carcass get up in the rock? The viper's tongue slayed him. Lucifer is concealed. He's corrupting his Christ, and it's the, the flesh of the Christ is being left out for all the heathens to feast on. They suck the blood 
the corrupt doctrine of Antichrist, a dead carcass, and they will die eternal deaths if they don't repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. So how does this tie back into the book of Jonah? The great fish is Leviathan. The point of the book of Jonah is being made more and more clear on a spiritual level. God's people get caught in idolatry. They go to sleep. God tells them what to do. They don't listen right away. So God punishes them. Then they listen. God delivers them and gives them a lesson. And and I'm going to continue on about what else happens here. So these are key scriptures that we need to know about. And I show an image of Pharaoh behind the, an image of the Pope just to make the point of the identities are shared. It says in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. He hath filled his belly with my delicates. He hath cast me out. Well, isn't Leviathan, the piercing serpent, the dragon that's in the sea, uh, made to play with the ships, the ships that are getting broken and shipwrecked, these false Bibles? Um, so here we've got a testimony that sounds like Jonah could have given it because uh, ultimately the piercing serpent swallowed him up and did not cast him out until God rebuked the great fish and caused it to vomit Jonah onto dry land. In other words, allowing Christians to be roughened up a little bit by the devil only to serve a purpose for God. Which leads me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So look at the word shipwreck, okay? These two guys, Hymenaeus and Alexander, were stuck with idolatry. Shipwreck means they had a ship, they had a testimony of Jesus Christ, but it got broken, it was wrecked somehow. And God turned them over to Satan for correction so they learn not to blaspheme, just like he did to Jonah, just like he does to any Christian that goes through a trial of their faith. Uh, God will periodically sometimes turn people over to Satan for correction. So um, that's, that's a powerful lesson, and that ties directly into the book of Jonah. In Psalm 104, it says, There go the ships... There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. If ships are Bibles, and Leviathan's the Antichrist, and out of his mouth go burning lamps, which are scriptures, this all ties together. The ships, Leviathan plays in them, and he wrecks the ships. You've seen pictures of, you know, uh, paintings and stuff from the 14 and 1500s where you've got a giant sea monster with its tentacles around a ship pulling it into the ocean, uh, something like that. Well, I believe those are all real creatures that exist, and God has created them, and there is a Leviathan on a natural level, and I think there's a Leviathan, of course, on the spiritual level. But for sure there is great counsel going on here about <clears throat> how Christians fall into scriptural deception caused by Antichrist deceiving them, and God has to put them on a mission to pull them out of their slumber so that they can be profitable as good witnesses to the lost of the world, which is really a major theme in the book of Jonah. Other key scriptures, Jonah chapter 1 verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Okay, we know from reading the book of Jude that a raging sea is symbolic of people in strife that are lost. So they cast Jonah into the sea, and Jonah represented rebellion against God, 
And then once that had been done, uh, the sea stopped uh, because of the Lord stopping it. Uh, God was satisfied that Jonah had to be cast into the sea. It says in Job chapter 20, He has swallowed down riches, and he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. When God casts something out of a belly, it's for a purpose. That purpose is served. If it's idolatry, he'll cast them out of your belly. Uh, these false scriptures, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. Um, in Exodus chapter 15, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he hath cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned into the Red Sea. Red is the color of scarlet. Sea is a group of people, so that would be Babylon. Chariots are symbolic of Bibles as well. So the Antichrist Bibles, God's cast them into the sea. Um, in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, it says, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. So uh, my love would be representative of the Babylonians, the lost heathens. And uh, God is just simply telling us a company of horses is also symbolic of a group of people typically running swiftly to mischief in Pharaoh's chariots. In other words, Antichrist Bibles, lamps without oil. Pretty basic stuff here, but you see the common thread is that God casts things into the sea or out of the belly to serve a purpose. And it's because of rebellion against God that he has to cast things um, out or, or in. So as I mentioned before, uh, they took Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And I also talked about in Job chapter 20 how God shall cast riches out of the belly, and Pharaoh and his chariots will be cast into the sea, and then in Micah chapter 7, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So I wanted to put all these scriptures together again so that I could make the point that God is serving a purpose here. He's casting idolatry into a place where it's going to be gone. Okay, Jonah was idolatrous. He was slumbering. So he was cast into the sea, and the devil roughed him up until God rebuked the great fish, and he was vomited onto dry land because he believed God. The dry land foreshadowing Jesus Christ, of course. Okay, In Revelation chapter 18, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Remember, Nineveh had violence in their hands, and violence is symbolic of idolatry, and the great city is, is Babylon, just like Nineveh was. But God called his people out to repent and turn from their idols and transgressions, and they did, so he wound up having compassion on them, uh, because they had no discernment prior to that. Okay, so God is taking sin and casting it into the sea, and Babylon is like a great millstone that's being cast into the sea because those are people that never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So all this ties together, and it ties in perfectly to the book of Jonah, where Jonah is cast into the sea because he's idolatrous. And then he goes through some hard lessons, and we all need to take heed from that. So these are, again, more key scriptures. Key scriptures about the great fish. In Isaiah chapter 30, it says, That walk to go down into Egypt, remember Egypt is spiritual Babylon, and have not asked at thy, my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Remember the shadow symbol that I mentioned earlier. Um, the shadow of Egypt would be the shadow of Babylon, which you don't want to be trusting the shadow of Babylon because it protects you from God's decrees. It shields you from God's decrees so that you're stiff-necked and hard-hearted and you don't hear the words of God. Uh, that's what the lesson is in Isaiah chapter 30. And then in Job chapter 40, it says, He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. 
<clears throat> he's talking about the devil. Behemoth, the king of Babylon, lies under the shady trees. The ones that conceal God's doctrine and cast a shadow on people that would otherwise have the truth, but are being blocked from the truth, from the sun of righteousness with healing in him, the light of the world. They, they're sitting in the shade of Babylon, in the covert, the, the place of concealment of the reed and fens, the reed being symbolic of a prophet, a false prophet. It says in Isaiah chapter 36, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed, in other words, like a broken prophet or broken scripture, on Egypt, which is Babylon, where on if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. There's that word, pierce. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust in him. Pharaoh is Leviathan. He is the piercing serpent. So the words are critical here. I highlighted pierce because that's what happens when you start trusting the broken Bibles of Babylon, which have flooded the markets today. And we can all take this out of the book of Jonah. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 27, it says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So remember, Pharaoh was called a dragon. Pharaoh was called as a whale. Pharaoh is Leviathan. Um, and... Pharaoh is representative of the visible head of the Babylonian faith, the Pope of Rome we have today, the piercing serpent. And his whole game is to corrupt the scriptures, to give you broken ships, to pierce you through with his false prophets so that you don't have discernment. <clears throat> whale, definition of whale, one that is impressive especially in size. So a whale of a difference, a whale of a good time, would be one way to define whale. And I put an old English definition here uh, that you can read. Looks like whale, akin to old high German, whale, whale, and perhaps to Latin squalus sea fish. Uh, whale has its roots in defining a large fish, for example. So just because somebody calls it a whale, God calls it a whale, doesn't mean his term whale fits men's definition of whale as a mammal. God called it a great fish. A whale would be expressing the size of the fish as a great size, and it also serves a purpose of defining the name of that whale, Leviathan, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the Pope of Rome, the head of Babylon, the prince of Babylon, the visible head. So do you get this understanding from the book of Jonah? God freed Jonas from his disbelief and idolatry and released him from the bondage of Antichrist. If you go into Proverbs chapter 30, verse 19, you'll see things that are rebelling against God. you got a serpent on top of a rock, if I remember correctly, but you got a ship in the sea. So you got this ship, this Bible in the sea, masses of people that, that you know, is a, a going to be a broken vessel. Uh, things that God is acknowledging are in rebellion against him. In Isaiah chapter 28, it says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Not make haste to feed on corrupt seed. At the end of the Song of Solomon, it says, Make haste, my beloved. And it talks about how Leviathan makes haste to feed on corrupt seed, which he turns around and, and feeds to all these people through his dead flesh. That's what's going on in the Song of Solomon, and it all ties back into the book of Jonah because of the purpose of being released from idolatry. So Jonah was in the belly of hell and because of his idolatry. God chastened him and only released him when God was ready. So, 
note that I put God freed Jonas from his disbelief and idolatry because Jonas was in the belly of the whale, Leviathan, the Antichrist. Uh, I did not use the word Jonah because I'm referring to the lesson that Jesus Christ taught us spiritually about the book of Jonah. So, Jonas and the whale. Not Jonah and the whale, but Jonas. Okay, and then I put down references to how that all ties in. Matthew chapter 12, Job chapter 41. The name of the whale, Leviathan. Do you get this from understanding from the book of Jonah? God showed Jonas how Babylon fell into idolatry by a lesson after the people of Babylon repented. How does this apply today? If people will turn from their transgressions, turn from their idols, get rid of these false Bibles and just believe the word of God and actually receive the Holy Spirit and get spiritual edification out of the word rather than arguing over natural understandings. For example, Leviathan, is it a crocodile or dinosaur? Is behemoth a hippopotamus or some type of monster or what, could it be a dinosaur? And all this natural nonsense, which people in the Christian community have been conditioned, especially by their pastors and the so-called Christian leaders, to just hear plain and simple speech only, because apparently there's no deep spiritual meaning beyond that. When Jesus says, Speak I to them in parables, so they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, he's telling us, He's blinding those that think they have sight and giving sight to those that are blind. In other words, God's word is spiritually discerned, so the natural man receives it not. Don't be like a natural person. Even if you're saved, if you have a spirit of slumber, God will wake you up. He'll say, arise, when he's ready for you to do his will, just like he said to Jonah. I'm going to continue on. Do you get this understanding from the book of Jonah? God had mercy on Babylon when they repented. It says in Daniel chapter 12, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. You're not going to understand anything spiritual if you're not saved. If you don't have the Holy Ghost in you, you, you don't have a spiritual understanding of the pure word of God, because you're probably not in the pure word of God. You need to trust Jesus Christ and get convicted when his words uh, fall on your heart so that it lands in good ground and you can bring forth fruit. Otherwise, you can talk about Jesus 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and never once confess him by the power of the Holy Spirit and then face judgment where you'll be cast into hell. You can talk about Jesus all day long and still be cast into hell because no one can confess Jesus is the Lord except they do it by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Revelation chapter 7, it says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, so people will be faced with great tribulation and will wash their robes. They'll come to great faith during great tribulation. Uh, my preference would certainly be for all of us to have our faith before great tribulation happens. In the world, we're all going to have tribulation, but great tribulation is going to be so horrifying. You don't want to have to come to faith during that time. You want to be protected going into great tribulation so that after those days, then the angels will gather the elect, as it says in Matthew chapter 24. Jonas and the whale. Do you get this understanding from the book of Jonah? God taught Jonas that his mercy on Israel and Babylon is greater than the mercy of men. See Isaiah chapter 5. It's a great chapter to read where God reveals the rebellion of his people against him, but his great mercy and tolerance of reaching his hand out and still be willing to help. And it ties so heavily into the Song of Solomon, it's incredible. So I would encourage everyone to read Isaiah chapter 5. Did hell open her mouth? Did God save his people? 
was Jesus Christ foreshadowed. So in conclusion, all textual critics are consumed by the spiritual nourishment of the papacy slash Leviathan. There is no understanding apart from the pure word of God. God will have mercy on those who repent and believe in his word. This is the spiritual lesson in the book of Jonah. This cannot be discerned by the molten calf idols, in other words, corrupt scriptures of Babylon, known as the critical text. Many or all modern Bibles today are corrupt. God will save his people. Further, God will show Christians, i.e. Jonas, how deceptive things are by revealing a devastating famine that has nearly destroyed all faith by the worm. Okay, the, the faith on earth is hardly here at all. Jesus Christ even asked the question, when he comes, shall he find faith on earth? Okay, God's word has been nearly taken out of the world, and there's been so much doubt cast on it, as I've talked about in previous sermon lessons. Many Christians are happy to witness to the lost, including the modern Bible professing believers. But we get angry sometimes at the layers of Babylonian deceptions. We don't like a lot of Christians, and I'll put myself in this category, nobody wants to hear that they're wrong or have been deceived. Nobody, you know. If you use the word rapture, well, that's a word that comes out of Leviathan's lamps. Sorry. So if you still think you're going to be zapped out of here before tribulation, pick a word that's in the canon of Scripture, not coming out of the mouth of the great fish. Strong's. Strong's is uh, useless to a Christian uh, unless you're using it as a concordance, but a lexicon is useless. It just defines words so that they naturally line up with the Church of Rome. Schofield, he was married to a Catholic and thought Leviathan had the best representative of the Word of God in the Vatican and Synatic manuscripts. He didn't know anything. He didn't use the 1611. He used a broken scripture. So Schofield just is another Closet Catholic, in my opinion, having been raised Catholic and reading about Cyrus Schofield and all of his notes. Why do so many KJV-believing Christians think that Schofield means anything? It's because they've been taught by their pastors, who have been taught by, in my opinion, the Jesuit priest from the pontiff of Rome, sent out into the world as they were crowned locust. Okay, Trinity, well that's a word not in the canon of scripture but you'll find it in a hundred places or so in the Catholic Bible. Um, taking the mark of the beast. You hear somebody t say that phrase, take the mark of the beast. They don't know what they're talking about. Jesus never says it's going to be taken. He says people will be caused to receive it, and he reveals in a multitude of places how it's going to happen. For those that have ears, let them hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. God explains how people are going to be caused to receive the mark of the beast. So why do we need these Babylonian heathens coming into the church telling us about their natural understanding of what's going to happen? Everybody that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, if you're not sealed until the day of redemption, you're going to be caused to receive the mark of the beast whether you think you are or not. It's going to happen. Okay, and God gives us some examples of how that happens in Scripture. But again, this stuff is transparent to those that don't have discernment, that are sleeping. Christ-likeness. Well, the only one that wants to be like Christ is the devil. He wants to be like the Most High. The rest of us, well, we can just follow Jesus and give thanks for being saved from the hell we deserve because the only reason we're justified is by grace through faith. The law has been fulfilled because we believe Jesus Christ. We have his righteousness. We can't be like him. The devil wants us to think we can, but we can't. So uh, literal plain speech only interpretation is silly. Uh, Jesus used plain speech when his disciples needed to hear plain speech so that they would hear and believe him so that the next level is they could receive spiritual things. Okay? You have to use plain speech when you're first witnessing to someone. That's how God speaks, plainly, so that they can get the seed onto their hearts, so that the seed can take root and they can bring forth fruit, which won't happen unless they receive spiritual things from the Word. They have to get beyond the plain speech. Okay? They don't receive, the natural man receiveth not the things of their spiritual, uh, spiritual things. I'm paraphrasing. Okay? 
They're spiritually discerned. KJV, not the AV 1611. You know, that whole subject I've covered pretty thoroughly. How many papal concessions do you want to take in something called a 1611 Bible that's been changed in hundreds of places, if not more? Uh, I'm not accepting any concessions. That's why I spent a couple years going through the 1611 Bible. I know every deviation. I don't need somebody trying to tell me, you know, what's right or not. I believe the testimony. I get discernment, um, and this is what God's teaching me. I would encourage everyone to be bold in their faith and have confidence in Jesus Christ. Pray and trust him to lead you to all truth. Okay, seminaries. Seminaries are infiltrated 100% in my opinion. So w w find somebody that's ever learned anything out of a seminary that is spiritually discerned, and maybe we'll have a party. I have never met anybody that got spiritual discern discernment by going to a seminary. Jesus Christ will plant in good soil and call his, out his people in Nineveh. In other words, God, many will be purified and made white. The whole point of the book of Jonah on a spiritual level is we as Christians a lot of times become idolatrous. We get stiff-necked. We don't listen to God when he tells us what to do. So we're put in a spirit of slumber like Jonah was. He was fast asleep in the ship, snoozing in his Bible, and he was ultimately cast into the sea, down with the Babylonians, the raging sea, swallowed up by Antichrist, and was in the belly of hell, chastened sore, until God rebuked the great fish and released Jonah onto dry land. When Jonah believed God, then he was released. Just like Christians, they get tired, or we get tired of being chastened, the mire of the world of Babylon, and God sets us back on track. But the one thing that I really want everybody to take note of is God gave Jonah a lesson in chapter 4, he kind of put him through the cycle of what Nineveh had been through. He uh, allowed Jonah to have temporary comfort to build a booth to show kind of like a superficial faith. He prepared a gourd to give him shade, and then he caused a famine, and Jonah got angry. Okay, and, and God was just showing him what happened to Nineveh. Nineveh fell into idolatry just like Jonah did, but they repented, and God had mercy on them. And he had mercy on Jonah by rebuking him out of the belly of the great fish. So I really hope that and pray and trust that this lesson, I don't expect anybody to agree 100% with me on everything, but that it gives you a new level of spiritual discernment when you read God's word and an appreciation for being saved and understanding spiritual things that apply throughout the rest of scripture that you need to know what's going on in the Song of Solomon or in Job chapter 40 and 41 or in Isaiah chapter 5 because it all ties in together even into the book of Jonah when you have spiritual understanding. Thank you guys very much for listening. Uh, this went a bit longer than I had anticipated, but I really hope that you guys get some good lessons out of this and are willing to share this testimony if you're convicted because I'm pretty excited about it. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but it's really a good refresher, in my opinion, for understanding God's word on the next level at a spiritual level.